Hello and uh, welcome to a brand new episode of ET Markets PMS Stock, a show where we discuss the opportunities as well as investment strategies deployed by the fund manager in the popular space of ultra HI investing. Well, my name is Shadhajan, and today we have with us a very special guest, Sandra Sarkar, who is a senior portfolio manager and co head of equities at uh, Quest Investment Advisors. Welcome to the show, Anirudha. Yeah, hi, Shadej. Good morning. Morning. And uh, thank you for being part of the segment, uh, Anirudha. Now, the flagship multi-cap PMS scheme has been uh, there for more than 15 years. If someone had, uh, you know, remained invested for, uh, you know, let's say 50 lakh, would have turned uh, into considering a CAGR of 15% because there are very few schemes, uh, uh, especially in the PMS, who are a decade long. Yeah, I think, you know, the, uh, the Quest flagship PMS is something, you know, which we are very happy because, you know, out of all the so many uh, hundreds and thousands of PMS schemes as of today, uh, it is one of those few schemes which has a 15 year plus kind of a track record and uh, it has seen all the good times, bad times, you know, you, you name the events from 2007. So we would have launched the fund just before the, uh, you know, global, the, crisis. global financial crisis and it has seen everything, a financial crisis. Uh, the European crisis, ILFS, pandemic, in spite of all that, it has given roughly around 15.7% annualized return, which means a 50 lakh rupees invested uh, 15 years back would have become roughly around 4.9 crore, or you can say wow. 10 times in 15 years. Wow, that's amazing. And uh, that's the power of compounding uh, if uh, somebody has to understand that in a nutshell uh, and uh, uh, you know in fact uh, a very good number and very few schemes which which we have also seen who have stayed that long and given that kind of consistent returns uh, that is something which is uh, uh, which uh, i mean all kudos to you and uh, uh, the company itself uh, for their uh, you know risk management practices as well as the way they pick stock so we'll come to that definitely now let me go on to the uh you know the other one the more recent multi pms scheme uh, has also delivered impressive returns tell us more about the investment strategy of that particular state. so the multi the quest multi pms uh, we launched it in august 2014 so i would say that also has a decent track record of around eight nine years now and that also kind of you know uh, is very much similar with regard to the flagship returns. Like flagship has a much longer period, but the Quest Multi also has around fourteen and a half to fifteen percent annualized return over the last nine years. Uh, the strategy which we follow in the Quest Multi is basically the two pronged. Uh, one is sector rotation, and uh, second is the market cap rotation. Now I'll come to the sector rotation a bit later, but the whole idea about the market cap rotation is basically, as the name itself says, a Quest Multi portfolio, right. is to be agnostic between the large cap, mid cap, and small cap depending on the market conditions. Uh, over the different time frames, if you see, uh, there are times when the large caps look good, there are times when the mid caps look good, and there are times when the small caps look good. Both on the valuation front, earnings upside, uh, the risk reward framework. Investors typically, you know, they tend to jump between the large cap fund, mid cap fund and a small cap fund. But in a Quest Multi PMS, he gets all of that in one fund because we as investment managers are taking that call whether we need to be more overweight on the large caps or the mid caps or the small caps. If I see the history uh, over different time frames, we would have gone up to almost like 70-75% into the large cap at times. And there are times when we would have gone up to like 60-70% into the mid and small cap. So depending on the market conditions. Now coming to the second most important uh, strategy which we follow in the Quest Multi is the sector rotation concept. Now it's very uh, simple, you know, as the name itself, um, you know, implies. To put it in the simple words, I would say be there in the right sector at the right time. Uh, easy to say, difficult to implement, <laughs> but uh, but I would say that you no, know, it comes with experience and time. That uh, you know, you need to be there in the right sector where the earnings up cycles are. And the whole idea about the sector rotation is that, you know, you identify the up cycles in different sectors, look for sectors where the uh, earnings upside is going to happen. You can say many other times it is one of those hated sectors where, you know, very few people want to talk about it. Mm -hmm. And uh, you try to get a bit early on over there and you try to build position in good companies in that sector. So idea of sector rotation is to write the economic cycle, earnings cycle and the valuation cycle, which kind of is there in different companies. Now, if I see in the last uh, seven to eight quarters uh, in the Quest Multi PMS, there has been a visible trend of, you know, decreasing allocation towards export side and increasing allocation towards the domestic side. True, true. Yes. This is a macro trend. Now that would get reflected into 
wherein we went underweight i just give an example uh, we went underweight big time into the it sector and uh, you know practically we don't have any it so we would be one of the only funds i think you know which we don't have any it uh, you know but we increased our allocation towards everything to do with the domestic whether it is uh, domestic consumption industrials etc so sector rotation is the core philosophy around which the quest multi tms operates right now definitely sector rotation is one bit but within the sectors uh, how do you pick stocks for a pms scheme so what are the different filters uh, you know that you uh, put across for picking stocks see i would say that you know when i say sector rotation is what we follow many times you know investors they think that you know we are looking more of a macro and we are the macro investors i try to put it across that you know uh, macro outlook can take you to some extent but at the end of the day we have to buy the companies i, I cannot buy the macros So I would say that you know, end of the day, we are still the bottom up uh, pickers. We look at the bottom up ideas, but I would say the process begins from the top. We identify the sectors we want to be in, and then we are looking at you know which are the companies within that sector which we want to kind of you know um, enter into. Uh, I would say that you know one thing I keep saying again and again is that uh, there is no information arbitrage as of today. You know, everyone has the same set of information, whether it's financial. or numbers or anything mm-hmm. only thing which is there at our disposal i would say is the interpretation arbitrage which means you know what sense do you make of the different macro and the micro data uh, i would say we lay a lot of emphasis uh, when you talk about the filters for evaluating companies i would say we lay a lot of emphasis on the softer aspects to it because uh, that is something which i would say differentiates one investment manager from the other because end of the day if you feed the same numbers in an algo Mm-hmm. and have the same parameters algo will give you the same output but uh, we are not algos i would say that you know that is where you know the differentiation happens and uh, that is where i would say we try to put that into perspective so i would say the first and most foremost filter for us is the management quality management's track record of executions uh, management's ability to execute what they promise and also the management's ability to be ahead of the curve with regard to innovation with regard to being ahead of the competition and that is what we spend a lot of time in understanding how is the management the software aspects of the business uh, once the company meets the parameters with regard to all the management filter checks hmm. then we look for uh, companies where the roe profile is improving uh, we look for companies where the margin profiles are improving uh, we look for companies where the market share is improving um, we look for companies where uh, the company has increased pricing power in the space which it operates also we do look for companies uh, wherein the balance sheet is quite i would say the leverage is not high now i would say that you know when i say leverage uh, the common thing comes that you know uh, that why should you look at companies with leverage that is where again i would say we are a bit different because we do look at companies which have leverage because typically uh, the cyclical companies are the ones which are sitting with the high leverage right okay. and uh, if you are able to catch a cyclical company at the bottom of the cycle with a high leverage as the earning cycle goes up the leverages come off multiples improve and that is where the whole multiple expansion happens so we are not i would say averse to companies you know who have some leverage on the books but yes it should be a leverage which you can service it should not be something which can uh, kind of you know take you out of business absolutely and uh, in fact i was uh, going through the fact sheet and in your flagship scheme uh, the portfolio is uh, uh, you know heavily invested in the financial services as well as consumer services so uh, and a part of it you already explained that uh, you know the portfolio is slightly uh being drifted into the domestic economy part so what makes you confident uh, you know in these two sectors uh if i look at the portfolio i would say that uh, you know we can broadly break it up into these three major buckets now i call them major buckets because uh, it's like the way i would uh, comp- uh, break the compartments for the portfolio the three major allocations in the portfolio will be one will be financials right. second is consumption and the third i would say is industrials okay. so these three form i would say the pillars of my portfolio as of now if i'm bullish on india i have to be bullish on financials consumption and industrials now if i look at the reasoning why you know i am confident on these things uh-huh. and uh, if i look at the financial part first uh, the bank le- the lending growth is i would say accelerating at its highest pace which we have seen in the last so many years and almost like an 8 to 10 year high and uh, after coming out of the covid after coming out of so many of the crises i think that's a very encouraging data and that is where i would say the balance sheet of most of these banks they have who have come out of that npa cycle they have improved a lot and they are well capitalized in fact now it is a case wherein uh, the managements are pushing the banks to kind of lend because your balance sheet is so strong and you are not lending so i would say the lending growth is something which is very encouraging 
Uh, second is I would say if I'm bullish on the domestic capex cycle, if I'm bullish on the domestic PLI cycle, uh, more and more uh, manufacturing uh, things happening on the domestic side. Also, the fact that capacity utilization is also picking up, and you know historically we know whenever the capacity utilization goes above 70, 75 percent, that is the time when the fresh capex cycle uh, comes in. We are, I would say, all these things are giving you the confidence that the financial cycle is here to play out. And uh, if I look at the type of the lending growth which is happening, it is happening across the retail and the corporate side. It is not just one part of it. It's a broad-based kind of a lending growth which is happening. So that is my optimism on the financials. Uh, coming to the consumption part of uh, the portfolio, why I'm bullish on consumption. Uh, there are two broad trends I would highlight with regard to the consumption. Uh, one is the premiumization of the consumption, which means okay. you are wanting to migrate to the high valued products. And second is the formalization of the consumption, uh, which is basically the shift from unorganized to organized. So these are two broad trends which we are trying to play. One is shift from unorganized to organized and second is the ticket size of the consumption items which are buying that going up. Mm -hmm. And uh, if I broadly put how our consumption allocation is there in the portfolio, uh, we are very bullish on the whole urban consumption. And uh, if you look at the portfolio also, we don't have any allocation to anything to do with the rural consumption. It is all about urban consumption, whether it is hotels, whether it is uh, the retail, whether it is the travel and tourism, uh, whether it is autos and within autos, the passenger vehicles and the commercial vehicles. So it's more about urban consumption and that is where we are very bullish on. And lastly, the third pillar of my portfolio will be the industrials. And that goes without saying, if you are bullish on India for the next five years, looking at a five trillion economy, uh, manufacturing, which makes up around 14% of our economy, is bound to go up to almost like 20% in the next 36 to 48 months. And when that happens, you'll have all the industry, uh, industrial engines, uh, you know, at the full steam and capex cycle, whether you're talking about capital goods, you're talking about the welding companies, you're talking about cement, uh, ancillaries to the uh, engineering goods, all of that is what we are bullish on. And defense also forms a large part of our uh, industrial focus. So these three, I would say, are the major pillars of our uh, portfolio as of today. Oh, absolutely. In fact, uh... If you look at uh, the collections or the GST collections that we have seen so far, 1.5 lakh crore, I mean, that's tremendous. Uh, and uh, we've been clocking that uh, consistently or above the 1 lakh crore mark. So, uh, yes, uh, the economy is slowly, slowly moving towards the, you know, form formalization of the, the formal economy. And that's very good uh, from all aspects. Now, uh, we are indeed, uh, you know, heading towards record high, just a percent or two away from that particular uh, number. How should investors play the small and the mid cap thing? Uh, in fact, for the last uh, four to six months, you know, uh, we have been of the view, and in fact, we have been saying this in all our investor communications, mm -hmm. that uh, the next 24 to 36 months, you will find the small and mid cap outperforming the large caps. Okay. And uh, there are multiple reasons to it. Could be valuations, could be the balance sheets, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But I would say that our view is that investors should focus on the small and mid caps for the next 24 to 36 months. Okay. Uh, but I would say that uh, you should not be looking at a very, very broad based allocation. You have to be very focused what you're buying. And I would say that remains the same for even any company, any sector you're looking at. So I would say our way of looking at the small caps and mid caps would not be very different compared to what we are looking for in other spaces of the market. But if I have to just highlight some pointers, what investors should look out for in the small and mid cap. I would say you should look for sectors, you know, which have the tailwinds and the growth drivers as we stand today, because that is where the big multiplier effect happens in the small and mid cap companies, wherein the sector is going through a massive tailwind and it takes the small companies to a much, much bigger space where it is uh, going to operate. Second thing very important is to look at the balance sheets of the companies in the small and mid cap space so that they are not over leveraged because typically what happens is when the interest rate cycles are pretty high now, if you have a large leverage on your book, it takes away a good part of your earnings. That should not happen because if the earnings cycle goes down and you are sitting with a high leverage even then, definitely it will hurt you. So I would say we look for small and mid-cap companies where the balance sheets are not leveraged much and it's very, very comfortable. In fact, if I look at my own portfolio of the small and mid-cap companies, they would hardly have any leverage on their balance sheet. Uh, the third thing should be focused on if you're looking at these companies is that where the capex is already done, and uh, capex is about to come on stream that is a very very big inflection point when the small and mid cap earnings take a massive upturn and that is where the market starts giving it a higher multiple so look for companies in the capex uh, completion stage 
and which is going to come on stream in the next couple of months quality of promoters goes without saying there can't be any compromise on that True. and all the more if you're looking at small and mid cap companies that is where more of the accidents happen hmm. so i would say you have to be extra careful uh, and in fact you know when i look at companies in that space we spend a lot of time in visiting the company's management plants talking to their factory workers to get a sense how the management quality is so i would say uh, quality of management in the small and mid caps becomes all the more important and lastly i would say look for companies in the small and mid cap space who are increasing their market share in their area of operation and who are launching new products or who are entering the new markets wherein all these things along with a capex completion is go- is the right ingredient to take you to a much higher earnings platform no absolutely you've uh, summarized most of these pointers very beautifully i'm sure our mm-hmm. viewers will take note of that and uh, any new stocks which you've just added to your schemes and completed exited uh, recently so i would say the uh, names which we would have added in our portfolio uh, you know uh, is to do with the themes which we would be kind of bullish on and i would say the domestic consumption theme is something uh, which has been the most recent addition and when i say most recent could be 6 months uh, mm-hmm. from where we are today Uh, so the names which we would have added is a couple of names in the retail space. Uh, we added something like the Trend. Hmm. Uh, so the disclaimer is we had would be having all these names in our portfolios of our clients. Right. So Trend would be one of the names. Zomato would be one of the names. I remember when we bought Zomato at around fifty rupees plus minus. Investors were very uh, kind of you know afraid. You know you're, you're buying into the new age companies and these companies are you know falling every day. Idea was that we bought it almost like a forty percent discount to the IPO price. IPO price, true. Now what comfort yeah. do you get? And that was kind <laughs> of you know you can say practically the rock bottom. Right. So we got into Zomato also at a good price. Uh, the other name which we would have added is Indian Hotels and EIH. uh both of them being a part of the you know travel and tourism we are seeing the type of you know the hotel demand and the pricing uh comfort which they have so it's not good for me as customer but yes for <laughs> me as an investor it's a very good thing right. that uh, you know the hotel business is kind of you know doing extremely well and we would have bought into auto ancillary in a big way uh within auto ancillary we would have bought into mahindra ci right. so these were kind of the names which would have entered mm. uh, most recently in the last 6 months uh what we would have exited as i mentioned earlier uh we have been underweight on it for a long time and uh it has definitely helped us being underweight on it uh underweight to the tune that you know index has say around 13 14% it and we had almost like 6 7% half of what the index had last couple of weeks we would have practically exited the it also whatever we had so we are now at completely zero allocation to it it's a big risk i know you know if you have 14% in the index and you don't have anything uh what if that uh, you know sector starts doing well but my view is that uh i would remain negative on it at least for the next 6 uh, months if not more right. so it complete exit is something which we have done uh, we have booked some profits from the defense stocks which we were very overweight on earlier we had a high allocation towards defense companies which has done very well for us uh we have booked profits out of defense because i think the market is factoring in way ahead you know already you know people are talking about fi 26 27 28 numbers and you know discounting it backwards so i would say valuations are something which is not very uh, comforting but yes if you ask me uh, sector is definitely here to stay but we have taken some profits off over there so these would be the broad entries and exits which we would have done in the portfolio right in fact uh, for defenses uh, the p expansion happened really too early i would you know i would say that uh, but earnings have uh, are yet to catch up uh, uh, well uh, next thing is also related or next question is also related to, so how do you manage risk and what are the tools that you use uh, in managing the risk which is an important part of uh, managing the portfolio interestingly uh, you know i'll just give you a different context you know when i talk about the risk management uh, when i talk to um, you know domestic investors on the hni side the risk management is the last question they ask okay in fact they don't ask <laughs> they don't to be honest they don't even ask about it yeah. uh when i talk to uh, foreign institutional investors the risk management is the first question they ask okay and uh, that is the focus area but i always highlight to investors that the risk adjusted return is what one should look at hmm. i should not be taking you know undue risk just to generate return because at the end of the day when the market t- takes a turn Hmm. a high risk portfolio is definitely going to get hit and we have seen that you know you would have seen i would have seen that you know in the bad times the risky portfolios get hammered so i would say uh, the risk management is very important in our portfolio and how i do it uh, one is um, ensuring that we have the the weight management system in our portfolio wherein for any small cap 
we have defined a particular weightage that you know any small cap company should not go beyond this particular weightage any mid cap company should not go beyond this much weightage and a large cap company can go up to say 10% of the portfolio mm-hmm. also for a small cap company we should not own beyond x percentage of the company otherwise it should not happen that you know i'm sitting with a big chunk of the company and something goes wrong i have no other option to exit but you have to sell at a huge discount right so the weight management of the small mid and large in the portfolio is something which is very very important and mm-hmm. uh, that is something which you pay an eye on second is the uh, i would say the impact cost of entry and exit that you know it should not be a very very illiquid company because if you are sitting with a very very illiquid company you know buying is easy i would say mm-hmm. the easier job is to buy a stock difficult job is to exit a stock because either you would exit when things turn bad and when things turn bad you will not find any buy on the market so the liquidity management or the impact cost management is something which we keep a tab on that you know how many days it would take to enter the position and how many days it would take to exit the position exit. right so that helps us to ensure that you know there is not a very very illiquid portfolio which you are sitting with which will hurt the investors return when the things turn bad so these are the broad i would say the uh, the risk management things which we do from a portfolio perspective uh, from a more uh, i would say uh, entry point perspective i would say uh, the aspect which i mentioned about the the management quality mm-hmm. that is something which we spend a lot of time on and uh, thanks to that i would say there has been no such cases of our portfolio companies where in a corporate governance issue would have emerged would have so that is a very big risk management which people don't factor in because it's a more uh, Uh, i would say the softer aspect to it but it's actually a parameter which can't be quantified but if you are able to take care of that aspect at the point of your entry i think many of the big accidents can be avoided and we have ample examples of you know uh, such companies you know which were the hot favorite of the street and there has been a corporate governance issue and the stock has been hammered that's a very big risk management you know so that at the point of entry you do your check that there are no quality aspects with regard to the business so these would be i would say some of the broad uh the risk management parameters which we are looking at you know while building up the portfolio right well, on that note uh, thank you so much uh, for your time and you know and that's all for now but do stay log on to etmarkets.com for more on news business and economy again thank you so much for your time thank you, thank you.